and that there is a very, very attractive income stream attached to attached to undergraduate students. So I think we may well start to see some some rebalancing of, of, of certain schools, uh, like this university in the city that's that's making making some changes. So we unquestionably we are going to see change there. How it plays out will very much depend on, depend on how um, schools want to position themselves. And I think if we've got one thought on differentiation to finish with, it's the the full service, slightly middle of the road business school is the one that's going to face the real challenge. It's about focusing on particular areas and having particular attributes in its in its DNA, if you like. Um. Rachel, I'm going to turn to you and ask you about profit and, and surplus. But before I do that, can I give you a quote from a piece that was published in the Financial Times uh, back in early June uh, by a guy called Prof the Professor Len Shackleton from the University of, of Buckingham. And he, he commented that employers continue to report dissatisfaction with many business school students they interview. This may be related to low admissions requirements as vice chancellors insist that business schools expand recruitment to cross subsidise other subjects. Indeed, the overcharging of business students to keep history or arts departments open is a hidden national scandal. Um, and if I then link with what he was saying about you know, the difference between profit and, and surplus, I think so. one of the challenges that's identified within the business schools, and, and that's, um, you know, the quote, that's really what Len Chakraton is trying to say there, though it's common in the US as well, is that, that because it's not very clear where the money goes within the universities, we are most of our business schools are part of universities, but actually delivering on some of the things that we want to deliver on schools is a challenge for us because actually the money just simply leaves the business school and goes somewhere else. Uh, yeah, uh, to, to, to link those two, but I, I think you've hit sort of the nail on the head in that um, there are some very bad practices in, in public institutions, what the public <laughs> now means, uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean therefore that uh, we should open the, the floodgates to, to private providers. What deals with that issue and what deals with bringing together is that we have to return to a point in which our institutions are democratic and where governance is representative of actually who are of the stakeholders and, and the partners in that, in that environment. Uh, and in the creation of knowledge and in the transformation of lives and, and the things that our universities do that are, are hugely inherently uh, vital to, to, to the country that we live in, uh, those those values uh, and uh, uh, should be represented in the, in, the, yeah, in the governance and democracy of the institution. So, for example, uh, courts or whatever you call them used to be, uh, where, sort of where community leaders would come in and, and talk uh, and sit as part of the governance structures, and they now basically don't mean anything. They don't have any power. They don't hold anything. They're their 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 top tick box exercise. And actually, community leaders should sit. You know, those in our community should sit and have and, and, and their their stake in, in that organisation and in the, in the, the uh, university should be listened to in the same way that students should and the students through the students union I have to say but as a, as a collective academics should trade unions should support staff management this is a partnership and and again in terms of thinking to where that surplus goes I remember when I was a sabbatical officer this was in 2010 so it's when the university passed nine thousand pounds. Um, and one of the fears of the university actually was that uh, how would have explained to students that their money, some of their nine thousand pounds, would go on support and access and bursaries. And I said, well, you know, you have to turn around and explain that in, in the same way that somebody used to go to postgraduate education, because that is the academic cycle of university, and that is the community that you're joining, and and, and that's how it should be. Um, yeah, when there's bad practices and vice chancellors are taking. Ex that, you know, ridiculous wages. We've got problems of spending their money, more money on their on their expenses than they do on, on wine anticipation. We've got a problem, but that doesn't mean that that students' fees or or, how, or students' contributions, as I would hope would be in the future, and not through fees and debt, uh, would be uh, would be would be shown to do that. And that is why public money is important in higher education, and that is why business money is important in higher education, because it to, in order to fulfil all of those. Uh, and unfortunately, that is why. You can't achieve that balance in a, for, in my opinion, in a for profit, and why I think we will never not have a moral objection <laughs> to for profit because you can't achieve that balance or that or those objectives because they don't exist because it, the objective is to create profit uh, for uh, through transactions for step for you know for one set of stakeholders and not for the community of stakeholders. John, on, on, on the work that, that you've done with, um, with the um, Higher Education Commission. I mean, how, how do you really 
I mean, I know the report's coming out soon. I don't expect you to give anything away. But, but in terms of the, this kind of issue about the balance between undergraduate and postgraduate, has the Commission really kind of been able to get its teeth in it? I mean, in a sense, postgraduate has partly been seen. I mean, if I think about the Brown Review and the kind of the three words within the Brown Review and postgraduate, which basically took all the money away, um, it was partly, and Brown justified that on the basis that he kind of, oh, it's all a private market. It can just do what it's doing. We don't need to worry about it. Really, if we're worried about skills in the future, we need to focus at undergraduate level. Has the Commission really been able to get its teeth into these issues about the balance? Uh, yeah, I mean, one of, one, of the, one of the key findings, I think, will be looking at um, postgraduate education um, and its relationship to the stages that go before undergraduate and, and then uh, your formal uh, secondary education and seeing that in a holistic life. Because one of the things we were finding when uh, certainly industry was coming were saying, well, we have to spend a lot of our time in uh, remedial education, basically bringing up students, uh, graduates up to speed, uh, and, and we would have expected them to be at a far higher level than they are. So I think you know, we do recognise that there's an issue right from secondary school mm -hmm. all the way through. Now how you, I mean, it's quite difficult to sort of reverse engineer that, you know, so, but, but we're certainly seeing um, the, the ideas that are being put forward are very wide, diverse, uh, set of ideas in terms of funding solutions, we're certainly recognising that problem. I mean, in terms of just going back to what we were saying about pro um, for-profit providers, I mean, I think um, those for-profit providers that don't distribute their surplus to students and student experience, they'll see students voting with their feet. And I think, uh, I'm, you know, I, as you know, I'm com comfortable with private providers, um, but they will have to do that. Um, in terms of those the differentiation point, I think the would be the, the ability to uh, provide these employability opportunities, which would be key. And in particular, I think one of the things we found on the HE Commission was that there was a lot of focus on um, um, uh, postgraduates wanting to go into big corporates, but not much on SMEs. And I think that ability to you know, encourage students to go into start, start up businesses and build some businesses that are developing, because that's where a lot of the sort of hands on uh, opportunities in terms of learning how business operates uh, you know, sit. Actually, I was really struck by the point you were saying about kind of this uh, sort of student learning journey, and actually just how important it, it, you know. I think there's a danger here that, that actually the institution, if institutions themselves don't actually recognise that journey, um, that, that actually we what we lose opportunities because we don't actually connect with students you know, properly as they work their way through through the various uh, interactions they have with us. But actually, we uh, at higher education institutes and business schools. Um, by kind of thinking about you know, where the students actually come from, as Angus was saying, what can we be doing to actually support students to properly uh, develop themselves at, at that level? There are issues, uh, particularly for business schools, even you know, around whether or not we want to encourage students to study um, business studies at, at A level if they actually want to come through to, to university. And actually, but, but if that is an issue, we need to consider it and come up with a response to it rather than kind of you know, sticking it to, to one side. That's certainly an issue. When the students are with us at undergraduate level, we need to be thinking about preparing them uh, for the world of work, as you said, and that's a world of work which is actually a, work, a world in which they may create their own business work in an SME or actually go on to, to work for a big uh, multinational. And those are very different uh, career paths and we must, must think about that. But I think also that, that actually we ourselves, in terms of providing those, those undergraduate courses, must be thinking about students as both potential postgraduates and then how, how we can support them through to that um, part of the journey. Or actually, if they don't want to go down that route, or maybe they come back to postgraduate later, how we support them um, as alumni. And actually, if, if institutions have got proper strategies for actually kind of really understanding the needs of students at all of those different uh, levels, I think that actually we can actually start uh, ourselves actually um, gradually changing the way in which, which um, students think because things are just there for them. They get the right kind of messages at the right time. They get the right kinds of interactions to support them in the journeys that they actually want, want to take. So I think, I think that's a really, really important point. And I'm, I'm glad that the Commission uh, has picked up on it. Um, I recognise that we're coming towards the uh, end of our, our time. Um, are there any other questions or observations from, from the floor? Okay, well, I'm going to actually, I will turn back to the panel and just ask if, if they could, could offer their observations. As I say, this is, this is the, 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 you know, we're, we're at the beginning very much of the process here. We've raised some really big 
uh, I mean, actually a very wide-ranging uh, debate, really interesting issues that we, we've thrown up. And, and I can assure you that, that the ABS, in terms of taking forward its policy work, is thinking about these things, um, what we can take up, how we can actually develop things, work our way forward. We've got a piece of work that we're, we're doing at the moment, particularly around innovation, which has uh, picked up on, on, I think, a number of issues we've talked about today, particularly around community engagement, working with business, graduate employability, um, and we'll be actually uh, releasing uh, some of that work in a couple of weeks' time, uh, and then formally uh, publishing a, a report early in, in the new year, uh, hopefully again with some, some very clear uh, actions and, and some further uh, work to be done, done there. So I think, uh, thank you uh, so much for coming and, 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 and contributing to a really interesting uh, debate. As I say, I'm going to actually hand back. So just give me your kind of one thought about what the ABS actually needs to focus its work on if we genuinely are going to be moving forward and business schools are going to be able to, to seize the future. John. Um, it's going to be about um, businesses, the business schools and universities working harder to find ways of supporting their students and uh, I think that will be in a number of ways uh, but I also think it's also about offering employability opportunities. Um, I think uh, it's already been mentioned, but the, the responsibility that institutions have to the communities in which they sit, and recognising at the moment that the new fee regime created an 11 percent drop in mature students, and these are the these are the unemployed people that need to be retrained and reskilled, and, and how what we're doing to, to, to sort of meet that meet that demand. That's fine. And the last word then to Angus. Okay, to a brief. I think we need to look at developing the absorptive capacity of the SME sector to work with to work with business schools. If this is a sector that is going to be absolutely key to the economy, we need to ensure that we can work better with them. Part of that involves us, <coughs> business schools, changing the way we operate, but we also need to work as an association very closely with a range of organisations that engage with SMEs to assist them in engaging productively with us. Okay, well, can I thank our, our sponsors for today, which are UPP, Hobson's and University Business Magazine, and for their support throughout the policy uh, network uh, process. Uh, this has been videoed and we are continuing, continuing our conversations with, with Shivana and indeed she'll be speaking at our annual conference in a couple of weeks time so we will feed back the various different comments that have been raised today directly back to her so she will have heard in her absence what she would have heard if she had been here. Thank you so much for coming and thanks for coming.